the things that I think would be interesting to talk about this afternoon. I, I know that the headline of this discussion is that we will talk a little bit about audiences, but I think it's important to start off by saying that as far as I'm concerned, the, the pre-production of a film, the production of a film, the post-production, and the introduction processes is already not accurate in terms of the experience of being a filmmaker in relation to an audience. And um, it, we were discussing yesterday, Tom and I, about what we might discuss today together. And I think that one of the things that interests us is the relationship between the deaf ear in fact, the very deaf ear of the director and the hearing ear of the director. So that would be a title I think would be an interesting way in this afternoon to talk about how you need to listen as a director and how you need to be deaf. And uh, also in terms of a, a campus like this one, it, it seems to me, I, I, I only came to Berlin a couple of nights ago and I came along to the Russian event that you were all at. And, and uh, what, what intrigues me is that, in the end, what Tom and I will say today is much less relevant than what you've said to each other all the way around this week and the opportunities you've had to be together as filmmakers. Because I think that the, the, the most interesting thing that Tom and I can do this afternoon is simply to sit here and be two directors together. Because normally what happens, as you know, is that filmmakers are separated from each other. That directors meet actors, they meet producers, they meet distributors, they meet all kinds of people in their crew. They tend not to meet each other. And that's a very, very important bond to make, is to realize that you're not alone, that you share the same anxieties if you've made one film, ten films, fifteen films, that the situation is largely the same for everybody. And you only find that out by, uh, by being around other filmmakers. And the fact that Tom and I were able to make a, a film where he was the director and, and I was a producer was a wonderful opportunity just to sit and see how another director goes to work every day because it's a bit like, I suppose, the, the bedroom. You don't get much opportunity to see how other people operate in there. And, and uh, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's a big secret. You know, Tom and I had dinner last night and we, we were with some friends and he, he was saying, well, you know, I don't know what directors do because I know what I do, but I don't know what other filmmakers do. And, and I think it, it is a mystery and it doesn't need to be a mystery. And so this very, it's the event of this week that seems more interesting to me than any wisdom or lack of wisdom that we might be able to offer to you. But I do think that, that we can speak a little bit about this process of having shot a film having cut it and having prepared it and then the issues that surround the releasing of your film to an audience and what the relationship between the filmmaker and the audience might be, could be, should be, often is. And it's, it's I think, something connected with the process of going from the privacy of making a film. I mean, it used to be that a director could often hide the film from everybody in the process of making it. He, the dailies were not available to be seen when you were shooting. There was no video assist for producers to look at or the studio to look at. You went to the cutting room with a moviola and you could only see it by yourself. You couldn't screen it. And you could, in a way, achieve uh, absolute privacy all the way through to the release of the film. Now, with the new technologies available, everybody can see anything the next day anywhere in the world. I've just made a film called Mountain in Romania and the studios in Los Angeles and New York were seeing the dailies at the same time that I was. And it's a different world out there the directors operate in. So there are many things to talk about in relation, I think, in this little time that we have about the moment that the film stops being the private property of the filmmaker and becomes first the property of the film distributor and then the property of the audience and how you adjust and how you learn about your privacy and your secret in public. There's a, there's a great saying which is, you know, that if nine Russians tell you you're drunk, you should lie down. Uh, uh, and that, that 
that's something that, that filmmakers have to deal with when they take their child, the, the thing they've created out into the world and see what happens to it. And, and that's what I mean when I say the deaf ear and the hearing ear, because as you know, we work in a very dirty river. We, we're not artists who can make our painting and hang it on the wall and walk away. It, it's, we're, we're constantly in a relationship with our other workers, the workers who help us make the film, then the workers who help us market the film and release the film, and then the people who experience it and give back their comments to us. So that we're, we're not allowed the, either the privilege or the dubious privilege of walking away from what we do. And one of the weird experiences for a director is that you don't ever lose your films because you're always having to answer for them. You, 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 there are many directors in Berlin at the moment who are in the second year of release, you know, are traveling around talking and speaking of their film and having to be responsible for it a long time after they finished making it. So we're at that, I suppose, in your week, we're at that sharp end of the process where the, the dreaming of the film, the creation of the film, the making of the film has all happened and now we're having to sit like this in front of public and, and, and speak on behalf of our film and understand what we've done as storytellers. And, and one of the things that we thought would be interesting today is to talk about how films begin. I don't mean the process of films, but literally how the movies that we make begin themselves. Because in that first two or three minutes is the moment when your secret film becomes everybody's possession. And the attention that you pay in those first few minutes has real ramifications and repercussions about the way that people experience films and what you have to do to try and bring them into the world of your story. And, and we happen to have, between us and collectively, made three movies which have interesting issues in their introductions. So what we're, I'm hoping we're going to do is to look at the beginning of The English Patient, just the first few minutes, look at the beginning of Heaven, which is the film that Tom directed at the Kishlavsky screenplay last year with Kate Blanchett and Giovanni Ribisi. And, and then if we have time to look at the first few minutes of The Talented Mr. Ripley, all because they have particular revelations in them about this very nature of, of audience and what happens when you go from what you imagined you've made and you think you've made into the world that you have to face what you, what you have made. And I, I work with a wonderful editor, Walter Murch, and he's always said to me, stop talking to me about the movie you think you've made, look at the movie you've made. And that's the first audience that all of us get as filmmakers, as our editor. And it's been a bracing experience sometimes to go, particularly if you're a writer, director, as Tom and I both are, when you've been so long nursing a vision of a film to really start to understand exactly what it is that you've, you've created. Yeah, but that's an experience I can absolutely share. I'm working with a, <coughs> an editor, a French woman called Mathilde Bonfoy, whom some of you might have had the pleasure to work with yesterday, who uh, is actually pretty vicious in putting me out of my director's chair and putting me back into the audience's chair and um, sharing the experience from a different perspective, which I think is in the, state, in the stadium that we're talking about probably today more, the moment when you've, when, when a lot of people from outside think you've done it, which means you've shot it, uh, that this uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you've, when you've shot it that you've done it, it's absolutely not the truth, it means you're maybe and probably only to the max halfway through, because you're now facing the fact that you have to confront uh, what it is, what you've done, and what it will be, and uh, that it's not anymore in the process, in the process, in the process of being uh, being made, but it becomes its own personality, and this whole idea of letting go and letting and realizing there's something that has to find its own way and its own existence. Very much, I know it's, it's kind of a cliche, but it very much reminds me and I think a lot of colleagues um, throughout that process of this idea of having a child and having 
this idea of what this child should be and then at a certain point having to admit that this child has its own identity and personality and, and difficulties and that there are even things you hate but they are still exactly right for, for this thing and for this being. And that comes to my favorite issue that I always try to discover and investigate in discussions about what a film is, especially if it's what you call your own. And there's always this kind of dangerous idea of what, what, what does it really mean, a film, but for me, I always try to read myself more, uh, reading this line, a film by, as a representative for, for the idea that there is a subjectivity in this film. So it's nice to connect it with a name, but um, basically, of course, that name sta stands usually for a lot of names, for a lot of personalities. And of course it stands also for the perspective of an audience, so that there is the idea you actually confront with something that has an identity. I mean the movie having an identity. But discovering this identity is only possible if you, at a certain point, dis distance yourself from being, having this idea of being a creator and really becoming somebody who experiences this from a distance, which is really difficult. And I've had some very interesting, tough, but of course also very exciting times with Anthony who was constantly visiting us in the editing room, um, being as friendly as he is, um, a, a really insisting torturer on, <laughs> on reminding me of all this, or us. And um, I've also had some really interesting experiences with audiences in the process of testing the film, which of course it was an international production, Heaven, I'm talking about Heaven, the last film, the one we worked on together. And <clears throat> what was really interesting in this whole process that I, I was already not so complicated with this whole issue before, the whole issue of testing a movie and having test screenings for films, but um, being involved for the first time with a, with a company and a studio that Miramax, that, um, that, that excessively and even to a degree of being religious about it believes in uh, the truth of test screenings and the results of them. Um, so there is something that I doubt about it but there is also something that was so interesting for me to experience throughout the process of making the film that I'd like to share some of that with you probably later after we've seen openings of films. I, I want to not leave Berlin without saying to you is that whatever anybody tells you this week and whatever anybody tells you last week or next week about what you're doing, you have to understand that a very weird thing happens in our lives because we think of ourselves, I think, I hope correctly as artists, but we work in an industry. It's a very bizarre conflict and the time that you come to really understand that is in this moment of release. You realize that you are a film that has to be scheduled, you are a film that has to be publicized and marketed. It stops being, the artist has to put down his paintbrush or her paintbrush and, and start to become a salesperson on behalf of, an evangelist on behalf of the film. And I think that all of us, particularly when we're trying to get our first films made, and it, by the way, never gets any easier to make a film, we're always rubbing up against the industry in some way or another. And the industry is partly responsible for events like this. And, and what I feel strongly about is that what is important for each filmmaker here is his or her voice and his or her individuality. And that if you've been told a rule this week, I suggest you cross it out. If you've been told there's a way of succeeding, I suggest you cross it out. Because, interestingly enough, you know, I have a, like Tom, we both are producers as well as directors and writers as well as directors, so we have a very odd relationship, or quite a broad relationship with what we do. And I met with a very talented writer in England last week, a man whose plays have been performed at the National Theatre in Britain, very highly regarded, who decided about two years ago that he wanted to write for movies and not for the theatre anymore. And he said, I'm having trouble with the rules of the rom-com. And I thought he was talking about a computer.
computer because they put up the CD ROM, and I was think, thinking, what's that got to do with writing screenplays? Maybe he's talking about his final draft program, or what, what, what's wrong with your rom com? <laughs> He said, I can't get the turning point in the middle act of the... And I realized that somebody somewhere had given him a list of things that he had to understand before he could turn his beautiful voice as a playwright into an acceptable voice as a screenwriter. And the, the one thing that actually everybody wants is distinctiveness and individuality and personality and, and uh, the, the one thing that they try and do is take all those three things away from you because they're, it's very uncomfortable to deal with distinctive voices. It's much easier to say, well, last year, Four Weddings and a Funeral was a big hit, so how can we get our next Four Weddings and a Funeral? Maybe this person could write it for us if only they stopped writing the way they write at the moment. Whereas, in fact, the films that all these people, including me and Tom as producers, love are the films that nobody could dictate to you about. And there are no acts in films. The curtain doesn't come down, people don't go for a cup of coffee and come back for act two. It's a total invention. You know, and I remember when I was trying to make The English Patient, and a lot of people put their arm around me and said, you know, this film will never ever get made. I'm very sorry, and uh, it's about a burnt man in a bed talking to a French nurse, nobody will care. And it happened to me again and again and again, and then a very, very wonderful actress who'd been a friend and a you know, a real mentor to me, wrote me a letter saying, Anthony, I beg you, do something else. There is no third act in The English Patient. <laughs> and I wrote back and said, well, there's no second act, so that's good, we're, we're okay. I mean, what is an act? I don't know where any of this came from, these rules. And so I, I implore you to, to leave any collective event like this knowing that there are no rules, that every beautiful film that's made invents its rules and invents its voice and invents its shape. Films don't have to go towards a happy ending or a sad, there's, there's, there's nothing that works unless it's true to the vision you have as a film. And it's not about, so these sessions should not be about how to learn how to fit. They should be ways that all of us, however many movies we've made, learn to get better at speaking as clearly and as candidly and as honestly in our own voices and how to refine our voice. And the process towards the audience should not be about learning what the audience wants from your film. Because the audience will always tell you terrible things that they want. When, when the talented Mr. Ripley was released, my son encouraged me to go on the, a website uh, in the first few days of the release. And I read about 90, there were 2,000 uh, messages in the first day. And I read about 90 of them, and they were all about how cinema had been taken over by gay people. <laughs> Every single one of them. <laughs> and so if you're looking to put your film in front of an audience to find out what the audience wants from you, it's hopeless. But if you're putting your film in front of an audience to find out how what you want to say and how you want to say it can be better said and better understood, then, as Tom says, the process of presenting the film and then trying to listen back is a fantastically creative and useful thing because the fact of the matter is that we don't know how the film is speaking. I mean, the one very curious phenomenon that occurs, and Tom, who's made one of the fastest films I've ever seen and one of the slowest films I've ever seen, so <laughs> clearly has an ability to deal with pace in a brilliant and astonishing way, one of the things that is very interesting is that when you first watch your film with your editor, it goes at a particular pace. If somebody comes to sit by you and sits next to you, it slows down by about five degrees. If 10 people come, it slows down some more of 100. By the time 1,000 people are there, it doesn't seem to be going at all. Because there's something about collectivity which has some odd effect on pacing. And so certainly, even if nobody ever spoke to you at the end of the screening, you've learned enormously how your film is surfing, how it's going along in terms of the audience reception. And I think the other thing, that, which is why we talked about the introductions, and I, I suspect we're not going to get as far as Ripley, so I'm just going to tell you a few quick things about what happened with Ripley, which will help us maybe look at the English patient opening in heaven, is that I made a film set in 1958 in Italy. 
with American actors for an American studio. And it was about Americans going abroad. And when we screened the film the first time in Berkeley in, in Northern California, we asked some questions of this audience. And one of the most obvious questions I thought to ask, because of some experiences I'd had with English fiction, was to ask what year they thought the film was set in. And when we got the cards back, I read them, and the first five cards I read said the present day. And I realized that for an American audience, Europe is old. And so it looks old today, and it looked old then. So <laughs> why would they imagine that the film was set in the past? It always looks old. And that this made some of the content of the film very, very difficult for them to understand. You know, the modes, costumes. even the costumes said nothing to them because they looked slightly retro. And, uh, <laughs> so they were confused about the mode of transports being favoured by these people and the, and the fact they didn't have phones or fax machines. And, uh, and now, I, I'm not, that's not to, to patronise the audience. It was a problem that I had not thought about. When, when I'd made the film, because I assumed that everybody would understand, because the period is stated so many times that you wouldn't need to flag it. And so what we did was we went to New York, and we shot for four days in New York, and began an opening sequence. And I realized it was also an opportunity to tell the, the audience, or to try and demonstrate to the audience what kind of film they were looking at, what the rules of the film might be, because Every time you go into any movie and the lights go down, you begin again and you contract with the film. You don't know what kind of language the film's going to be in, what kind of way the film's going to speak to you, what the tonalities of the film are going to be, what, what its particular argument's going to be, and you try very, very quickly to connect, don't you? The first thing that happens, oh, that's, he must be married to her, that's her daughter, that's the dead fish that's going to be important later on. And sometimes when you're making the film, you think, well, the dead, what dead fish? I didn't see there was a dead fish there. Oh, I see that dead fish. They think that's important. It isn't. I must get rid of that dead fish quickly because everybody keeps saying it's the film about the family and the dead fish. You, know, that you, you, you have to understand that everything at the beginning of the film is about connecting so, so that people then know how to look. And so these first few minutes are about saying, this is my film, this is the language of my film, this is the world of my film, this is how I would love you to look at the film. And so, how we start and how we set those signals up uh, are extremely important. Shall we, have, shall we have a look at something like that? I mean, because I think the English patient really interesting in an addition to what you said about the talent of Sir Ripley because it also is a film that's not present tense but that also as I know through the beginning gave some information that people weren't really sure of where it's set. Yeah, the, 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 Tom, interesting enough, Heaven, we both I think got involved with Heaven for initially because it has probably the best opening two minutes of, of any screenplay I've ever read, um, Kishlavsky's screenplay. Uh, um, it's, it's, in fact, I'm terrified of seeing a film I've made alongside this particular introduction because it's sort of a brilliant, brilliant piece of filmmaking of a brilliant piece of writing. It's nice that you're saying it's two minutes because it ended up being six, six, six or seven and a half. Um, but interestingly enough, both The English Patient and The Times of Mr. Ripley the endings were made after we'd made the film. The beginnings, rather, were made after we'd made the film. So the beginning is a kind of assessment of something which then introduces the film, whereas Heaven is organically as it was written, except for one thing that Tom did, which was a sort of masterful stroke that we'll, we'll talk about later. But I just have to say now that I'm going to watch the opening of the expression for the first time since I made it, so uh, it's going to be a very interesting. <laughs> experience. <laughs> we'll, we'll show that first piece.
couple of years and seeing it again because I, I really think it's like a stunning opening of the film and it stuns me even more that this obviously wasn't written in any screenplay. This was not intended to be like this from any beginning. Well, one of the things that's interesting about that opening is that there you see the dead cat problem, which is the, the biplane, the plane with two wings. When we did our first screening for an audience, we asked some same questions again, this question of where up, what's going on. And, um, yeah. and, and where, where are we and what's going on? And everybody thought that they were watching a movie set in the First World War because the two wings of the First World War and one wing is the Second World War. <laughs> and it's another illustration of the fact that this is a hobby horse of mine, which is that people reading a screenplay is very, very hard for people. People, lots of people whose job it is to read screenplays think that screenplays are about dialogue and what people say to each other. And in fact, of course, nothing could be further from the truth because what happens is, is that the, 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 sent, the film sentence is not composed of words, it's composed of images. And that's what writers are writing. They're writing these collections of images and they have to understand them themselves. And the fact is that no matter what anybody says, it's what what's being read is the relationship of one image to the next. And so I can say as many times as I like at the beginning of The English Patient, oh, here we are, Mussolini is around the corner, um, Hitler's around there, well, you know, the Allies are landing in Normandy. If the images don't support that, then people are deaf to the dialogue. And we were discussing this last night at dinner about this, this little digression for a second, about the, the way that the people that we try and separate are often, maybe they're listening to me now and wanting to turn my mic off. The people that we often sell our films to are always so obsessed with what people say to each other in films. But if you imagine, and this example I was saying to Tom last night, if you imagine you write, I love you, you know, Tom says, I love you, um, how do you situate the, that dialogue? It, you know, completely modifies the way you, an audience experiences it. If Tom and I had come on the stage and Tom had opened his arms to you and said, I love you to everybody, that would have meant one thing. If he just whispered to Charlotte as she went by, uh, I love you, that would have meant something else. If he whispered in my ear, I love you, that would have meant something else. If he'd looked at himself in the mirror on the way in and said, I love you, that would have meant something else. <laughs> if he'd gone to the men's room and sat down on the lavatory seat and every time another man came in, he said, I love you, that would have meant something else. Nevertheless, the number of times that filmmakers have to try and talk about their film, film simply in terms of what's being said. In terms of what's being said, it, it, it's appalling, really. And what these openings of our films indicate is how important it is that we visually inflect the opening of the films. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dirt micro. <laughs> is it No. You want me to say something? <laughs> You should speak. Am I all right now? I'm back on again. Yeah, back. But, but just going back to the opening of The English Patient quickly, and I think we should move on. The thing that's going on there, first of all, just the story about the weirdness of making films, is that um, I had wanted to hire a, a titles company to make some beautiful titles for the film, and Saul Zantz, the producer, that's okay. Sorzans, the producer, said we'd run out of money to do any titles. And uh, my great friend saw that. Uh, um, so I didn't know what to do exactly. And then I remembered on the very last day of shooting, we'd been in Cinecittà in Rome and we'd been shooting various effects shots on the stage. And I, they were taking ages to do. And we'd been shooting for nearly six months. And I just was there on the stage waiting for the smoke to be the right density. And so I remembered that we had to shoot an insert of a painting 
for Kristen Scott Thomas um, in a moment where she's working inside a cave and she's doing some paintings. And so I found the artist who was making the inserts. And I thought, you know, this is so beautiful, the way this works on this paper. I think I'll just get a camera and quickly shoot a roll of her painting. And I'd completely forgotten I'd shot it. And at the very end of the film, when we were struggling to think of how to open the movie, I was going through all the daily bins, and I came across this insert of this painting. And that gave us the opening of the film. But also, what it did was, it enabled me to talk about what kind of film was being made. Because you're looking at what seems to be a ground, a brown ground, and then a big paintbrush comes in. So already you're told that maybe an image you think you're looking at is not what you think it is. Then that image folds into a moving picture of a man, which then starts to you start to realize that the, the ground has become desert, and then the shadow of the man becomes the shadow of the plane, and then the plane shadow becomes a real plane, and then the real plane gets, you know, and so there's a sort of sense of transition which is lyrical rather than structural that I thought was a very good indication of what kind of film because the film asks you to read it in terms of lyrical transitions and not in terms of literal ones. But also, we were able with that first sandy watercolor to talk about the desert, even though there was no desert in the shot, by using sound. And the other great potency that you have at your disposal at the beginning of any film is also to be able to discuss the sound world, to evoke the world of sound and what that's going to tell you. And so I came up with this notion of marrying the two types of sound in the film, which were this Hungarian singer, Marta Sebastian, whose sort of udulation is on the beginning of the film, with the underscore, which belonged to other territories. So that, again, everything is in the first couple of minutes is joining together in a kind of rather liquid way. You hear desert sounds looking at paper, and then that paper becomes the sand. You know you're in a foreign country before you see the desert. Uh, there, there are many, many elisions going on, so that actually, although it's a very simple title sequence, and, uh, it's actually speaking a great deal about the kind of experience that I wanted people to have when they sat for the whole movie. And in some ways, you can lift that out and say, well, that's what the film is like, that first couple of minutes. I think we should really, if you mind, look we should look at heaven because it really connects very well to what you've just said. I just wanted to say, can we, can we um, have a longer, well, then, I mean, a little longer piece than we said and have it end at the real title, Heaven, which is like just, I think, what we just um, agreed on was like 30 seconds earlier, probably. So let's have it a little bit longer after the, after the explosion when the title of the film actually appears. And for you who have not seen the film, which probably are very many, <coughs> because it was not uh, everywhere huge, um, we don't, uh, we didn't have a. There's no English DVD yet out. It's coming out in two months, so it's not very much dialogue in the beginning. But uh, those of you who don't speak Italian or German, because it's Italian dialogue with, Eng with German subtitles. Um, I'm just hoping that the filmmaking itself is convincing enough not to have you fall it is. asleep. Um, that's a little longer, it's like eight minutes, I guess, we want to see. Yeah. 
Ho chiamato tante volte e non avete mai fatto niente. Allora ci ho pensato io. Ho messo una gomma nel suo ufficio. Esplora tra 40 secondi. Chi parla? Filippa. Filippa Parca. No, senti, non ce la faccio. Però ho da fare qui. Scusa, tu aspettami. Vabbè, ti raggiungo dopo a casa. Ciao. So what is this film going to be like? This is what we want to find out in the first minutes. <clears throat> and I always felt like there is this opening which is so strong, but it's not all what the film is about. about. The film isn't only about somebody who's obviously very serious and, uh, and it's not only about this violent aspect. It's very much about actually the fact how we can look at things and um, people, of course, and um, situations and have a judgment and then have to redefine that judgment or withdraw that judgment or find a different opinion and different perspective onto this. And so I was searching also for other reasons which have to do with the ending of the film, but 
basically for the for for somehow finding a setup for the film that represents uh, this gesture that an audience should find immediately itself in a mood that prepares them and us for um, not trusting what you get first. So what you get first, of course, is a violent woman, but she will turn out very soon later to um, be more than that. And, and she will also turn out to be not a terrorist, what you might think in the first moment, but to be a completely different, vulnerable, uh, hurt, um, um, tender animal <laughs> that's running away from something instead of really confronting it. And um, because of, and, and this opening sequence with the helicopter simulator, of course, offered all these strange, um, uh, uh, actually, walks on that junction between is it is it is it real landscape? You see it, and I think in the opening moment, because you absolutely have no information uh, whatsoever where you are, you will definitely think this is real landscape. Then, of course, you realize it isn't. But slowly, by slowly, you realize there is something completely uh, artificial about it. And it's it's a setup to make you for uh, it's, it's seemingly a test for something, and of course throughout the making uh, throughout the film you will find out that it's a test for something that people have to confront themselves with, and I felt that and I've seen it in with the audiences later later of course that uh, without this two minutes in advance, before the sequence, um, I I guess. Um, it really changed the attitude towards Kate's character so much that you saw her just immediately with creating the bomb attack uh, that um, it, it really lessened our uh, availability for mercy and for interest in her. Only because we had seen these kind of abstract images before, it heightened our awareness and our interest in this character, which I, I thought was really funny and of course very exciting for me to realize and to see. I mean, it's a wonderful opening to any movie. I wish it was mine. Um, the, the, um, I think that, that just maybe heading towards a place where we would start to answer some questions from people, it, it would be just good to go back to this idea of the hearing ear and the deaf ear. Because what I meant by that is that at this point in the release moment of the film, <coughs> at the, the point when you're, as somebody said about, poetry, it's never finished, only abandoned. This is the moment where the movie is not finished, that you would have to be abandoned to an audience. It is learning how to receive the wisdom that's coming at you and how to hold on again to the thing I talked about earlier, which is how to hold on to your own voice. Because in Tom's case, as you would have seen from the number of people who get the credit at the beginning of that film, there are a lot of producers. And two of the producers, Sidney Pollock and myself, who have a company together, are also directors. And the fact is that if Sidney had directed this film, it would have been very different. Had I directed the film, it would have been very different. But Tom was the director of the film. And Tom is, a, as you can tell, a generous and, and intelligent and listening person. But he was also marvelously stubborn. And I always imagined myself in his position. What would I be like if another filmmaker came into my cutting room and said, that's too short, that's too long, I don't understand this. Is that how to know, how to teach ourselves when to surrender our ego about a film to a good idea and when to actually preserve our ego about a good idea. Because there were elements in this film Every time we had a preview, every time we got the results back, every time audiences talked to us, they would focus on particular areas. And it was very interesting to see Tom sitting in the back, listening, coming to the meetings the next day, yielding and having opened his one hearing ear to the things he thought would make his film better. But the ear which was about our film, my film, or Harvey Weinstein's film, or Sidney Pollack's film, was largely deaf, and I commend that to you as a way of working, because we didn't want to, to change his film, we wanted to get the best version of the film. And one of the things that you'll experience as filmmakers, I can only think of an, 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 an analogy, a way of explaining it. I, I, went to, I made a little film in England uh, about 12 years ago, Truly Madly Deeply, which is the first time I directed a film rather than just written. 
And suddenly I found myself being called the director. I'd never thought of myself as a director. I thought I was a writer. And so I had this odd honeymoon in Hollywood where I was a director. I, and I had an experience of going to Hollywood and making a Hollywood film. And it was a, a pretty extraordinary time that I had because I realized now in retrospect how naive I was about the process. And the analogy is this, uh, about... Uh, a friend of mine went to Bali and went to a market and um, went into the market and wanted to buy some material. So she took down some material and offered, said to the woman who was selling it, I'd like to buy this material. And the woman said, that's 10 baht. So she got out her purse and took 10 baht out. And the woman said, no, 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 no. You don't give me 10 baht. I say 10 baht. You say two baht, <laughs> then I say eight baht, and then you say four baht, and then you give me five baht. <laughs> and this to me is the process of movie making, because what I realized when I went to Hollywood and they said, we need ten baht, I gave them ten baht, and they said, oh, this is an idiot, he's going to give us ten baht every time we ask for it. <laughs> and uh, so they kept asking me until I had a very empty purse. In, when I was scouting locations, when I was casting, when I was designing, when I was shooting, when I was editing, every time they said 10 baht, I took my 10 baht out and, and gave it to them. And, and actually what the filmmaker has to do is to assert her or his sense of vision. That's why you can have a, a credit of buy, because somebody has to steer. Somebody has to steer the craft and not everybody can have their hands on the wheel of it. You have to have one person holding on, pointing the film in the direction so that every decision and every part of the film belongs to one compass and not to 50 compasses. And so this is the, I think, the constant trick is how to know that when they say 10 baht, they mean five, and you start with two. It's, it's this process of, of negotiating the best version of the film without letting ever letting go of your voice. But always, 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 always keeping in mind that in the end, which is really true what you said before, nobody really wants to take <coughs> away your vision. It's just that I, my experience was that also people who were sometimes a bit more uh, vulgar in their approach to give different ideas to me, which was definitely not including. Um, most of the producers, um, in the end, the desire is only to test, I mean, that's my experience, to test um, how, how sincere you believe in what you've done and how, how consequently you're going to follow it until the very end to find inside that vision that you have the perfect shape. And not so much to get rid of the vision and the shape and do something that's supposedly commercial. It's not, it's not what even those seemingly stupid people that everybody talks about all the time, like whatever these studio people sometimes seem to be. They don't, they don't, I mean, nobody wants to have a silly movie and nobody wants to push you into a silly movie. It's just that once you're not convinced about it yourself, what you're following, of course everybody gets insecure and, they get, and everybody gets nervous and wants to throw some recipe at you. And, of course, if you don't really eat it, then they try to take away the whole pot from you to put some more salt into it. Um, my experience in test screenings themselves is, um, for example, you know, talking about the deaf and the hearing ear, um, I'm pretty much deaf, I have to admit, which I think is different than Anthony, I'm pretty much deaf to reading the cards, which means I'm not, I'm not a great reader of what people then do crosses at and what they write. I always feel like, okay, this one person didn't like the dead fish in the background in scene 55 and proposes us to do it, <coughs> have it to be a green fish but a red fish. And then everybody comes to you and says, it's a green fish, why did we do this? And you say, well, this guy is probably even never coming back to buy a ticket for this movie. Why should we change the color of the fish only for this one person? So I'm really, I get, this is where I get maybe uncomfortable for people, but on the other hand, what is so amazing about a test screening is, a part of course, you need, from the fact you need some, some percentages of who liked it and who hated it, is the fact that you sit yourself, you, you situate yourself in the middle of six or seven hundred people, and that's for example where the experience with Heaven was particularly interesting, because um, Miramax, as complicated as the system might be, they're really brilliant and 
rather amazing in how, for example, to choose an audience for a film and to pre-choose an audience. And you, you always feel like, oh God, I'm going to sit in this New York theater crowded with people who just came out of The Mummy Part 2 and are squeezed into this place with popcorn and stuff like this. And, and then they look at this and they're going to puke and run away. And, and then we have to cut 45 minutes out of it. And, <laughs> The, the, the amazing thing is this is absolutely not true, and these are all the fears that we build up in our ideas. It's not true. The, the, the audience that I got from Miramax, because they prepared this, <coughs> was e extremely um, <coughs> fitting to my desire for the people that I wanted to reach. And, and the, the way they do it is very simple. They just make you, they, they choose only people who get a list of films, like 10 films, and they have to have seen at least five of them. And all those ten films were really, really interesting films. And uh, it was a pretty demanding list because I even hadn't seen all of them. It was like really some films of Gislowski from Atom Igoyan. Um, I think the, the most commercial film on the whole list was Run, Lola, Run. So, um, so I really couldn't say in the end, well, this audience is anyhow stupid and doesn't want to just look at films like that. They did, they did want to see films like that. They really cared. They, most of them even had an idea about Kieslowski and even were interested in European films and, and all this. So, and you feel it. You feel it from the people coming in that these are the people you actually want to communicate with. Um, of course, you want to communicate with everybody, but these are the people you might have in the end as an audience. So they should at least connect in some way with this film. So you sit among those people. <clears throat> and the amazing thing, of course, is that you don't... And we, we cut for ten and a half months on Heaven, which is really, I'm talking like mostly six days a week, um, 10 to 12 hours a day, really to a degree of hysterical exhaustion. But um, what happens throughout the length of that process is of course that you, you, you lose the distance, you, you still are so much in love with some of those shots that you've done, you know how much suffering was there, you know how much you hated uh, the act of to have you do 45 takes, but how much you loved her for doing the 46 takes so brilliantly, so how can you think of taking out the 46th take because it's such a genius take. And then you sit in the audience and it's just boring that moment. It drags and you sit there and it, you can't... And it's the only way to get you back into the situation. And if you yourself experience it as dragging, and this is the only thing that you really have to learn, then you have to, be, you have to face yourself with the fact... And, you have to, and then, of course, I'm meeting colleagues, and I've had that before, who say, yes, but I like it actually that it's dragging at that moment. I really think the film is strong when it's really boring at that time. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I'm not making real fun about it because I've said these lines myself, I know. I, I, it's, an, it's an idea we have. Being really the most brutal audience ourselves when we see other people's films, I think even especially if we see the films of colleagues of our own country or people that we know, we look at them like, huh, that's boring. I mean, we are like really tough on it. And we tend to change that perspective completely if it comes to our own work. And we say, well, it's supposed to be art, and art always has also these boring issues, doesn't it? And, and I think um, it's great like that. And of course, we know in our hearts, and of course five years later we really regret it, we know in that moment in this audience, and we know there is something wrong. It doesn't even mean you just have to cut it out, but something is wrong, and you have to go back and, and try to change that. And there's no way to get that experience more intense than, and more precisely than <clears throat> by sharing it with an audience in advance. I mean, I think what Tom is talking about is what I said at the very beginning, which is that the work on your film doesn't finish until this process is finished. And what was admirable about Tom in this situation and Mathilde and Maria and all the people working on the film is they didn't stop working. And this is the difficult thing about one's ego, is that you have to know that the work you put in is good work and real work and that there's nothing wrong with going back and revisiting an idea and changing it. Both of us like to write right up until the day of release because you can keep, you, you, the, the making of the movie is not finished until you've delivered the movie to, to the distributor. And I suppose that that, more than anything else, is the thing that I would be happy if you took away from this session, is the fact that the working process on a movie begins 
on the first day with the first thoughts about the screenplay and does not end when you finish shooting, does not end when you think you finished editing. It ends on the day of handing over the movie and that you, your, your job is to work, is to defend your idea to the death and to defend your vision to the death and to make sure it's the best, most beautiful and most rigorous version of the vision that you're capable of. I have this experience with um, a rather famous uh, producer, Harvey Weinstein, who, who, who is a good example for this kind of, um, let's say, let's call it a conflict, but a creative conflict, that uh, you have somebody who always introduces himself when he comes to see the movie, and when you invite him, he comes to see the movie as um, saying, I don't know nothing, my name is Joe Audience. This is how he introduces himself. and. Um, of course, I've learned from Anthony to introduce then myself as a Joe director and try to have a discussion about it. But of course, there's all this very direct and, 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 and forceful. forceful input. But what's really truthful about it, and I think he's a good example for being the most truthful character in this direction, that he really is um, very much able to put himself in this seat as being just an, a nasty audience, an uh, 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 impatient, as we all are when we are audiences, audience who just wait for a certain delivery, but also somebody, of course, who's ready to adjust his perspective on a film that, um, that, that opens and that gives us an information in the beginning that this is not going to be the mummy too, it's going to be something else, and he's ready to accept that as long as then the film follows that setup. And I, I have to admit that even in unusual ways, um, it was interesting to let to let this happen and not to be just protecting myself and building up all these walls around me, not to even be hurt or beaten up by it. Because in the end, it helped me to even clarify why I believe at certain points somebody like Harvey might be a little bit uh, feeling this is boring, but I'm not bored, so there might be people who aren't too. And and I was always strong in that opinion and so I never had to do anything that I never cut out uh, there's nothing that I did on this film that isn't um, part of the vision that we were following personally or subjectively. There's this wonderful thing and maybe if there are Japanese people in the audience they'll laugh at my description here but there's a story I read about how a, a samurai sword is made which is that they they take a sword and they make the best piece of steel and they hammer it out until it's as sharp as it can be, and when it's as sharp as it can be, they put it back in the fire again, and melt it, and turn it over, and hammer it out again until it's as sharp as it can be. And when it's as sharp as it can be, they take it and put it back in the furnace again, and melt it, and turn it over, and they bring it out. And that, to me, is what we're doing, from the very first day of working till the end, is taking the sword, and each time we get to a particular juncture, the screenplay, the shooting, the editing, we're making it as sharp as it can be, but then we have to be prepared always to take it and put it back in the furnace, turn it over and, and hammer it out again. And I say that knowing that I've just finished the biggest film of my life and that I'm just about to sit in the cutting room and have to take that sword and put it back in again and then everybody's going to tell me how many more times I have to put it back in before I'm allowed to give it away and, and get on with something else. And it's always like that. The first, the first thing you take out of it, it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen and you think it's so perfect. It's four hours, 55 minutes, but it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Five hours and seven minutes, actually. And, but you really think, at least for a week, this is like the brilliant and this is exactly what you wanted to do and what everybody should understand that this is it. And then slowly, <laughs> you move towards the fire again. <laughs> and it's right to do so because you shouldn't do four, five hours, eight. Okay, okay. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> Should we, would it be a good time to take some questions? Okay. And maybe we have some microphones, so who's next close to microphones should probably go there when we want to point them out, but maybe if you're in the center of it, it doesn't really make sense, so you scream when we try to repeat it. Okay, I'll translate into English. Where are you? Oh, okay, one, two, okay? What I would like to ask is, it's really a miracle for me that you chose this Kislovsky script. Because you're famous as such a cool and modern and experimental director. 
And Lola was so strong, and I could identify so much with her. She was so. And then you, then you took the Kislovsky script, and Kislovsky is really this director who is famous for these psychodramas of women, and who is really exact and slow and smooth. And I wondered how did you feel, and why did you choose this script for you, which was really kind of wonderful for me, because it's so, it's so split inside, and, and the part where the, the movie starts, you have this really cool kind of helicopter <laughs> training, and then it starts to be the, the female psychodrama again. And so I, I want to know how did you feel, and why did you choose this script? Uh, first of all, to me, thank you for me, I mean, uh, Run, Lola, Run is also a psychodrama about a woman, basically. And <clears throat> um, honestly, I see so many interesting parallels between those two films. Um, and uh, the differences, they, of course, also are obvious, but uh, in the development of the film the, itself, I, I felt really at home. Uh, and I was connected with uh, with my former work very much. Apart from the fact that you might have not seen the film that between those two films, which is called Der Krieger und die Kaiserin, The Princess and the Warrior, which was already um, largely slower and uh, excessively um, more uh, interested in the in the trance-like state of uh, characters. But uh, what I think would happen is is just like the very very quiet. Um, a mirror picture, an image in a mirror of Run, Lola, Run. It's just very quiet. But if you look at its uh, scheme in terms of the development of the plot, it, there's, there's a big similarity. If we had the time and would have to look at Run, Lola, Run, it's really funny because it's also taking exactly 8 minutes and 30 seconds, which is like the time we've just seen, for the film to set up the whole, de the whole device. Do you call it a device? This, the, the setup. And to, to, make, uh, to make clear what this film will be about, there's a woman who's obviously desperate and, and, and she's really getting in trouble and something has to happen now. And um, the speed of events is, is really high. It's just that the way, the way the storytelling goes is completely in a different mode. But the motion of the film continues to be like that, heaven, if you look at it, like the first 45, 50 minutes, it's like, you have like every five minutes you have a dramatic change in the storyline. You have like unbelievable events happening all the time. And for me the, the remarkable experience reading the screenplay of um, Piesiewicz and Kieslowski was that I knew um, I, I have done something like this before but I have never done it this way because it's so, there's a sparseness to it and uh, a nakedness and a clarity that uh, I have not yet reached probably and that I was really wanting to explore. I wanted to explore the territory of making a complex film based on really very, very simple um, uh, egg pointing. I don't know the word, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and um, that's why I was so tempted to do it. And also I felt really familiar with the material in terms of what it is about. I mean, the whole connection of of you know the fateful situation that happens here and uh, it's all based on a rather ridiculous coincidence that's something that immediately grabs my attention because I've, I've, I think I've done films before which had this um, strange fate coincidence background uh, that we founded like a couple of years ago called X Film and what's the idea of this company in terms of collaboration and um, because it's a company that was uh, actually, uh, I think it's eight years ago already, even more than eight years that we founded the company uh, being then three directors, one producer, now we're three producers, three directors, um, and having this idea of <clears throat> a group that is not trying to, um, that is trying to escape this idea of the isolation of the filmmaker, what we were just mentioning before, this problem that most filmmakers know somehow, even when you've done your film and you've had this growing group of people who advise you, help you, or support you, or discuss with you, and once it's done, they all vanish somewhere, and you sit there alone again, and t t setting up the next film seems to be, again, the most lonely experience that you can imagine. And we wanted to escape that by, by joining forces with, uh, with different people who identify in what they want to do in films, and, and the idea that we have, that we share, is actually to to make as subjective and as personal films as possible, in, uh, and not to compromise on any 
singular vision that we have, but still try to reach the audience and try to reach the audience to a degree that in the year when we were founding the company was seemingly impossible. There were no, no people were going to see German films that were not a comedy. Um, so um, we really started off at a very deserted area. Um, Having but, but having the backwind from, from some successes in the comedy area. And it has developed into this kind of, um, for me, it's, it's, it's really, a, I mean, there's a lot of bad downsides to this construction, uh, but there's really the upsides obviously are stronger because they, 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 we've done 16 films since then and none of them, and of course some of them were better and worse and whatever, but none of them really has not fulfilled this idea of a film, of being a film that really followed the vision of its makers and, uh, and, and every single of those films uh, got theatrical releases and was sold to other countries and all this stuff. So we feel still encouraged in the idea. What it basically means being together with directors in a company is uh, that you, um, you, you're you more on the phone with each other than you actually see each other. And um, you discuss the script once it's usually too late <laughs> to a degree that you should rewrite everything. <laughs> and then you rewrite half of it and then you shoot it in a way that is, of course, everybody still thinks, oh no, we already started shooting this and he's going to be a mess and everything. And then, of course, it's a continuous process of discussing it. I've just been, like, until four weeks before the release of Wolfgang Becker's film, who was here in the Berlinale, a good Berlin, and I, I, I was joining him and visiting him in the editing room, more or less doing what Anthony did with me or to me <laughs> in the editing room of heaven. And uh, this is something that I really, truly don't want to miss as an opportunity. They also come into my editing room. I mean, this whole idea of producers and directors not being enemies, but being partners. My really close partner, Maria Köpf, the producer of all my recent films, is someone I can't think of getting ever, I mean losing ever. Because Die Ausstattung und das Programm, Bild und Sorry, next question. <coughs> um, this is a question to Mr. Mingala. Could you tell something about adapting the book uh, by Ondaatje? Uh, <coughs> the process of adapting the book into a screenplay? Yes, I'll try. Um, 30 seconds. 30 seconds on an adaptation. Well, for, for what it's worth, I mean, I, I just finished another adaptation uh, of Charles Fraser's Cold Mountain, and I used the same process, and it's a peculiar one, and I don't necessarily think it's a rule. Um, in fact, I hope it isn't any kind of rule, or I'm going to offer any method which is worth you know, using. But I, I found that the only way to approach adaptation is to imagine that the novel or the source material that you're adapting has been lost. To imagine that all of the books of the English patient had been destroyed, that I had read the book and that my job was to go out into the world and try and broadcast what was extraordinary about it to an audience. And also I think that the simple way to answer it is to say that I think that whenever you read a novel, whenever you come into contact with other literature, you're running a cinema inside your mind. You know, you see events, you see people, you see faces, you see moments. And in the 30 second answer, I would say that the job is to take that cinema outside of your head and put it there. Yeah, this is a question for Mr. Mingala about uh, the process of editing. And you talked about your relationship with Walter Murch. And from my own experience, I find that the editing room is the place where kind of the direction happens most, almost. And wondered if you could say a few words about the process of almost handing over to someone and whether you do or whether you don't. Um, that's really uh, the, the editing process we both love, <coughs> both Tom and I love it, and we're both not passive people in the sense that I go to the editing room every day, Tom goes to the editing room every day. I, I think that one of the cleverest things that I've done as a filmmaker is to try and work with people who are better than me at their job. You know, the cameraman is a better cameraman than I would ever be, the designer is a better designer than I would ever be, even though I like to design, even though I like to shoot. And I can use an avid, so can Tom, 
but I once did a little exercise, which is that I cut a scene from The English Patient by myself. I was so pleased with myself. I wanted to show everybody my version of the scene, and then I saw Walters, and then I put mine back in the computer. <laughs> and I think that, that you, you know, obviously the thing to do is, is that you have to respect your partner at each stage of, of the process. If you're not a writer, to respect your writer. If you are a writer, to respect your director. If you're a writer and director, to respect the producer. But to keep finding people whose judgment, who you let into the hearing ear and not into the deaf ear. And Walter is somebody who shouts in my hearing ear the whole time. And he has an extremely, um, he's a, you know, I, Tom and I agree, he's probably the greatest editor of the last 50 or 60 years of film. And so, you don't have somebody like that come and work on your movie and then tell them what to do. You try and learn about your film from them. And so one of the things that I've established with Walter is that I've just finished shooting now. I finished shooting just before Christmas. I gave him a big chunk of movie. I didn't give him a single note about any shot, uh, about what the sequence was I'd intended, or even though each sequence was structured in a particular way. And he assembles the film without my involvement, so that I'm forced to look at his point of view of the film before I can impose mine on it. And I found that that's a very useful way of learning about what I've shot rather than what I thought I was shooting. And the process is one where I think you have to understand that there's another filmmaker, and that filmmaker is going to challenge you and look at and love your material and own the material and hate some of the material and, and keep fighting for the best version of the film. And as I said to you, I, I, I think it's absolutely the case that the writing process is as vivid in the cutting room as it is when you're writing the screenplay. And I've literally written and also metaphorically written by the, the maneuvering of, of, of sequences and, and, uh, and shots all the way through to the last day. And so I just feel that I'm very lucky and he's lucky with Mathilde to have such first rate people alongside them who can teach you as well as simply be the servant of the person who presses the cut button and the play button. And the... I think that's a really important and interesting perspective on the editing process to say, <clears throat> which I've also only learned through my work with the editors through Katja Dringberg and Mathilde Bonfort, that they taught me to understand the process of cutting really as completing the writing and that, that you realize then the script was more a sketch in the terms of that, that the writing process itself isn't completed at all. You really do it until the very last day of, of the editing process. And the, the idea of writing meaning you still can really, you, you, don't, you should never look at the material as something that is the, something that is already ended and that's already finished. Only because it's shot, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean, you don't even, you don't even know what is the, comedy part in your movie or what is the but then everybody laughs and it's it's really really fascinating sometimes in entirely the wrong places as well <laughs> yeah um it's a question to to uh, mr mignana why was it interesting for you to kind of more conventional what could have been the more conventional motivations of that character rather than making it more of a completely character study um well, that's a question which is appropriate for this forum of the audience. I mean, the, the, um, when we previewed The Times of Mr. Ripley, uh, it was a scary process. And I remember somebody asking me in the audience when we were going to shoot the last reel of the film. <laughs> um, because they didn't understand why the film stopped when it did. So if you're talking about it not pursuing conventional uh, mapping, I think that, that maybe that's why I, I don't believe in the act structure either, is that I, I, I try to do something and Tom is doing it, but I'm trying to do it in a way with, with the odds slightly higher because I'm spending more money, somebody else's money on my films, it, a lot of people, a lot of money, is that I'm trying to see if it's possible to make personal films which can come out under a studio system. And that's a very, uh, maybe over-ambitious idea, which is that I believe that this kind of scale of movie that I'm interested in making is by definition very expensive. I've just spent much too close to $100 million making a film. And when you take that check, 
you have an obligation to give it back. Try and get it back for the studio. And so far, I've managed always to give the studio their money back. By the same token, I don't want to compromise my own ideas and per personal voice. And so that's why I'm very interested in this audience process and the testing process, because I believe that if the film is made with integrity and it's made with skill and made with good people, then it will communicate itself to a large body of people and you don't need to make crass compromises in order to win, win them over. And in fact, the, the reality of the Sound of Mr. Ripley was that it made its money back in America alone, even though whenever we tested it, the audience was, was pretty <laughs> tough in terms of being disturbed by the fact that the character was not likable or apparently likable or, or it was hard to empathize with him. Whereas I thought that everybody is capable of understanding that you don't have to have a protagonist who's sympathetic completely, you just have to understand them. And so uh, that's what we worked on, was trying to make sure that you understood the process rather than endorsed it, applauded it, or rejected it. But it is a terribly hard trick to pull off, which is you know, that we've been talking about how to maintain your own voice, how to maintain your own voice. The more money you've spent, the louder the voices around you become, because then more you know, people will forgive you if you've lost $500,000. My first movie cost $550,000. They would forgive me if the movie didn't perform well in every country. If Cold Mountain, the film I've just finished, doesn't perform extremely well in every country, then it will be very hard for me to go out and make another movie. Um, so the, the stakes get higher the more ambitious and the more uh, um, huge the, 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 the landscape of the film becomes. So when we talk about films, it's, it's very hard because we're talking about so many different financial imperatives which dominate, you know, in the end, all of us spend much more time talking about money than we ever do about art, unfortunately. Can I just ask you a question? Still, oh, sorry? Just, can I ask one more question? Uh, okay. I just wanted to find out about um, your casting process and the importance of it and are you forced to use people that you don't want to use or do you have total control in that or is it, uh, and then, because obviously it's who you, it is that you're seeing for the whole movie, and it's so important, so I just wanted to hear about your processes with all your films. I think we share similar experiences, I mean, basically it also fits to what I wanted to add to what Anthony was saying, it is still true I think to both our experiences and to the experience of lots of directors that I know, that um, there is hardly any talented and interesting producer who's not fundamentally wanting you to be as um, individual as possible in your voice. It's not that any, but any producer who's really caring for movies, and these are the only ones we really get along with, um, uh, will block you in this, in, in developing this. And I had really... Uh, um, amazing experiences with that, even in situations where I knew there is, there is really financial pressure. But they all know that, and, and we all know that too, that the, the films that really stay with us and the films that, that finally convince everybody are those films that have this kind of spirit. Like, that's, that's what you can even say about a filmmaker like Steven Spielberg. I think the secret of his success, success obviously, and, and of course, is that there is a personality th shining through. Not only his own personality, he is also a very strong representative for someone who works very often with the same cinematographer, the same editor. I think for 25 years he's working with the same editor, um, the same composer. So that's, it's this kind of group that creates an identity that becomes a personality that, that's so-called a film, a subjectivity that is injected in a movie. And I think this is the reason why, uh, this is the, of course the, the, the major reason of its success and in this instance Spielberg doesn't really make a big difference to me to let's say um, and he will, would hate that if he heard me Jean-Luc Godard there is a real similarity in the concept of filmmaking in terms of there's my vision of films and I want to try to make the films have the climate and the atmosphere and the idea that that I can identify with and 
and um, probably there are intellectual different uh, expectations and interests, but um, that's important. And of course, that uh, communicates also in the in the casting process, which is one of the most important creative decision processes, and it's also something that determines more or less what what the the true energy of a film will be like. And in my case, for example, uh, I have to admit that more or less the first serious thought that I gave a casting idea, for example, in Heaven, was um, was Kate. She was like the really maybe the very first serious idea I had about the casting. And she uh, and it was never a discussion. I I don't know what would have happened if, if I had come up with somebody completely unknown and all this. Of course, it is an issue sometimes. It makes it, it, it if you if you look at a certain budget. Um, um, a producer looks at certain issues to be to get at least the potential for, for having this budget somehow um, surviving the process. And I think it was helpful to go with someone that, who's that known. But of course, Kate Blanchett isn't like a selling point as much as, for instance, um, right now Nicole Kidman might have become. Or, 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 that, or Julia Roberts, you know, it's not like everybody says, okay, Cat Blanchard, and you, are, you have a blockbuster. It's of course not like that. And of course, we, in the end, all know that there is no actor who can really guarantee this because it is always the combination that the actor is in the right part and has really, it's the right choice for the right actor in the right moment. And we've all seen even films with Harrison Ford flopping horribly because it just didn't seem right that he's running around in this movie. I'm talking about this recent one also, and um, that's 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 always happening. This is, and and the involvement of the producer is, I think, usually only to the degree that they try to, of course, always get something that that makes it easier to sell, but also always fulfill the idea that they know in the end if it, it is, if it's a mismatch, it's ridiculous. I have to admit though that I have been. Um, um, they were happy with Kate, but when I started to cast the other character, which was then in the end portrayed by Gio Giovanni Ribisi, there are some ridiculous moments when you start to be, what I said before, when you start to be a bit insecure, and not insecure because you don't know what you want, but you don't know where to find it, um, because you have to just search for it, then uh, immediately nervosity breaks out and people, and in fact this is like I'm speaking literally you now, are thrown at you and flown in, and people that you haven't even seen a photograph, you just see the photograph and say, well, he's 10 years too old, and absolutely it's not possible. And, um, but he's been, and then the casting agent says, well, they flew him already in from New York, and he's outside the door. And you say, well, but why didn't they even show me a photograph or a clip or anything? This happens, and it also shows, of course, that you know we don't want to praise all the time. You know all these nice people from the studios. There's a nightmarish attitude, for example, towards actors sometimes that is really unbearable to me because they they are really seen as we all know this, but experiencing it is even worse. That how much they're seen as objects and as, as, as something you just put like this bottle on the table, and and the director can say, I, I like uh, no, I like not this kind of water. I want a different one. And, and having flying in an actor from somewhere else who was like really nervous about it, and I knew before he even came in, he's never ever going to be this character. So what in the end you end up doing, uh, stupidly enough, but of course I did that, for example, like a couple of times before I really was angry with the people who were responsible for that. I did casting sessions for like 45 or 30 minutes just for the sake of not completely frustrating this actor for having had all this trouble to come here, knowing I will never cast him. I mean, he will never have a chance. And of course that's ridiculous. And this is also something that can happen to you. But it's more like it comes immediately, it happens when you start to open the field and they realize that you opened the field, then the, there's hysteria. It was terrible. <laughs> Should we close? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.